Let me ask you to stand as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to begin reading with verse 4. It's all right to talk about Pentecost in a Pentecostal church, right? Okay, let me try that one again. I'll stand over here a little bit. It's all right to talk about Pentecost in a Pentecostal church, right? Amen. That's right. I, I, I'm not in another denomination. I'm in a Pentecostal church. Amen. So we believe in this. We believe exactly what the Scripture says right here. So let's let the Word teach us today. Beginning with verse 4. There are diversities of spiritual gifts. We we're talking about spiritual gifts here. It says it in verse 1. But the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries... But the same, Lord, there are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all and in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Who is it for? For the profit of, who is it? All. all. It's for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom. Through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge. Through the same Spirit. To another, faith. By the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings. By the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. And you could say, by the same Spirit. He's, he's, he's already put that in place. To another, gifts of healing. By the same Spirit. To another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. And you could conclude it the same way, by the same Spirit. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Father... We are privileged this morning to be in not only your house, but in your presence. For God, this is just a building without your presence. This is just brick and mortar, carpet and wood without your presence. But with your presence, God, this is holy ground. This is a holy place. This is a sanctuary unto God. So Lord, we honor your presence. And we honor your presence in this moment by opening up our hearts and saying, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me, O oh Lord. If there's somebody else in this room that needs it, if there's some other need that's going on in our hearts, God, absolutely meet it. Absolutely read our hearts. Absolutely meet those needs. But God, I don't have to tell you how to do your business. You're already doing that. But God, in, 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 in the sight of all of those things, God, speak to us. Words that we need to hear. Not words that would be good to tell somebody else, but words first and foremost we need to hear from your word. That God, we may internalize your word. That we may not be hearers, but God, after hearing, we may become doers of your word. That my Father, the world may know exactly whom we serve. Not simply by words, not simply by apparel or anything external. But what, shine, what is in us, may it shine out from us. And God, may the world know it is Jesus that we serve. Thank you again for your presence and for your work and your people now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now you notice some similarities in this verse of Scripture. Paul is dealing with a Pentecostal church. He's dealing with a church that has felt the Spirit, that knows the Spirit, and the Spirit is working in the midst of the church. He's not saying, see, my preaching works. He didn't say, see, my administration works. See, the Jerusalem council and what it's doing, it works. No, what Paul is saying is God works in the midst of your church. God is showing up. God is making it special. They didn't have pews. They didn't have chandeliers. They didn't have stained glass windows. They didn't have a, a, a paltry amount of money compared to what we have in our bank accounts right now. But there's one thing they do have. When they showed up, the Spirit of God was present. The Spirit of God was working. The Spirit of God was changing lives. And Corinth may have been a den of iniquity, but in the midst of that den of iniquity, there was some light shining forth by Jesus Christ and it was impacting people by the power that Jesus displays. And He's making that clear to them because you've got to understand they don't understand this stuff. 
They understand all that wild stuff they used to do in the world. They understand all the wild gyrations they did before Aphrodite and, and before Zeus and between all the, the gods. They, they understand that they should bend the knee to Caesar when they ask them. They understand all those machinations, but they didn't know what God was doing in their midst. They didn't understand why he was talking, why he was doing these different things. So Paul is teaching them, I want to tell you what's going on in your midst. I want you to understand that God is at work and you need to let him work. You need to let him do what he wants to do. You need to have that mindset in you. And he goes throughout in painstaking detail. He says it doesn't matter whether it's gifts. It doesn't matter if it's ministries. It doesn't matter if it's activities. It is the same spirit. It is the same Lord. It is the same God. Sounds like the Trinity is getting to work in the church. That both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working in this church. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. It's not God one and God two and the God Gods are coming together. It is God at work in His church. That's what they needed to know. It's not weird. These, the, the pantheon that you used to have, that's all known void. There is one true God, and you know Him because He's been showing up in your services. So it is God that we are taught from this passage that is at work. Now, the reason why we as Pentecostals believe that is we believe I pray we still believe, because I know we, we do a lot of things in the name of church, but I pray what we believe is that we cannot accomplish God's will without God's Spirit being among us. I hope we understand that our programs are not going to do it. I hope we understand that even beautiful uh, services where we have the choir and where we have everything in order and everything clicks right, I hope you know that's not going to get the work done. That's not going to do it. And we can't, we can't outflash the world and expect to turn them from the world. Something different's got to happen. When God shows up, lives change. When God shows up, bondages are broken. When God shows up, lives are reoriented. When God shows up, people change. And that is the difference. When you went to work uh, and you were this way all week long, then you went to church and you were different that next week, that shows something happened that weekend that wasn't true in the week before. And I don't believe that's just for sinners either. He's not talking to sinners, church. He's talking to the church. If the church acts like every week, like nothing's going on, you went all week long, you said you went to church, but I don't see any difference. Where's the Spirit of God at work? It says God is at work, and He lists all the things that God is doing. Now, sometimes we like to get into the weeds, and there's a part, there's a part to play for that. Um, there's there's a, a looking at this closer. I just totally understand it, but sometimes we miss the big picture. I, I listen to them for you. God is busy, and what is uh, He saying He's busy doing? In verse 4, He's busy giving us gifts. You realize that? You thought Christmas was over. You packed the other thing away, you packed the celebration away, because the gift giving's over, and you'll wait for somebody's birthday or some anniversary to pick it up again. But the Holy Spirit's all about giving gifts right now. Yeah. He didn't close shop. He didn't close the doors. He didn't say that time is over. He is wanting to give you gifts. He's wanting to distribute them amongst His church. God is at work desiring to give. Let's break some of these things down that He's given. If you break down, what does He talk about? He talks about a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. He talks about prophecy. He talks about discernment and, and the different tones and interpretation. Again, we can get caught up in the, in the manifestation of those things, but you put all those things together. What's God trying to do? God's trying to give you knowledge that you don't have. God's trying to help you understand something you don't know. Now, some people have a problem with that. And I, I, I can understand some problem. Well, why don't God just speak? Why don't He just speak to me, cut out all the stuff, and, and just get right to the point? Well, number one, if God showed up like He did like on Mount Sinai, everybody would be out the back door. Because you couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it either. They said, oh, Moses, you start speaking. Because you know what? You're not that bad a speaker after all. We like you after all. Just don't let God speak to us because God's too holy. God's too great. I can't stand in His presence because I'm nothing like Him. So you speak. God wants to speak to us, but He doesn't use the same method. But you don't need it. 
Why don't all you people write letters anymore? Isn't that a form of communication? Why don't you go visit everybody? You don't do that. No, you, you will use letters sometimes. You will call people on the phone. You will, you will send them an email. But even email is too long now. Now you send texts. <coughs> no. Why do you do that? Why? Uh, some of it is certainly, it's certainly meaningful because you did, you know, I, I heart you kissy, kissy, kissy face. I mean, isn't that wonderful? That's meaningful. That's deep stuff right there. It's turns, you boy. We do it for efficiency. We do it because we can communicate all day long. I understand that. But more than anything else, it's easy for us. We like what's easy. But now we just have Valentine's Day. I bet you didn't go the easy route. I do. I do better. I bet you didn't say, I heart you kissy face, kissy way. That's all you did. If you did that, you in trouble. I'm just saying, you in trouble. Because you're supposed to take the extra effort. Man, we went out to eat. Took time together. I spent money. Can you believe that? I spent money taking her out to eat. Why? Because it mattered so much, I couldn't convey it just with a text. I couldn't say, I love you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. I couldn't say that. Because that's not meaningful. No, I use letters, and I use actions, and I use all kind of different language, and when I do it right, I get the okay symbol. When I don't, she looks at me funny like, you need to pick it up. So, you, know, you, need, you need to do a little better. We do that. Why? Why don't we just talk one way then, church? Why don't we just say, love you, that's it. Why don't we say that? Because that's not how we communicate, and that doesn't convey our love. God sometimes wants to send you an email. He wants to speak to you in your quiet time. Sometimes God has sent you a letter. He sent you a big letter. Have you read it yet? He has sent you a big letter. Have you worked your way even through a part of it? Because God sent it to you. But I'm going to tell you, God sends texts too. There's time when you show up in church and all of a sudden God comes down and He puts something in your heart and you better know God is speaking your number, speaking your name, and you need to listen. God cares more about the interaction than the, just the conveyance of information. Yeah, He could just throw out wisdom all the time. Then we'd be a bunch of heady people that don't care about nothing else. That's all we care about. But He says, I'll send you knowledge. I'll send you words. I'll even speak in weird languages, interpret those languages just so you'll know that it's me speaking to you. God wants us to know stuff. And if He's going to send it to you these ways, how are you going to get it any other way? Yes. God, I won't take your email because I'm just reading your letter. God, I'm not doing text today because I, I just want an email. I mean, we're going to tell God which way He can speak to us. I think we're the losers on that one. If God wants to speak to us, He is going to speak to us. And did you read that last verse? He distributes His gifts not as you will, not as I will, but as He wills. So we need to understand that, that, that old sign that we had to change. Thankful, sometimes our theology is bumper sticker theology. It's, it's front, 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 front of our vehicle. It's tag theology. God is our co-pilot. We got, we got thinking about that real hard. That means I'm half in control of my life. Maybe I ought to just say God is my pilot, period, and I ought to just sit in the back seat and let Him run the show. That is what the Bible says. You let God do what God did. Because I didn't save God, but I'm going to tell you what God saved me. And God spoke to me and God changed me. So how about I let Him do what He wants to. Let's throw out the other ones. Let's throw out the, the, the gift of faith. Let's tro throw out the working of miracles. God wants to tell us, I'm acting in your behalf. I'm working for you. In ways you can't work for yourself. You can't do this. And when you do it, you should be called down for it because if you're doing it, it's not God. And I don't like that any more than anybody else because if you're going to do something in God's name, it better be God that's doing it, not you. Because my spirit is offended when a person does that. And you offend me when, when you do something in God's name and I know God is not within a million miles of it. 
Because I treasure when he does speak. I treasure when he does work. Don't do it for the show. Don't set up a tent and declare what God's going to do. You just let God be God in the midst of his church. Let him work and let us follow his lead. It's worked for 2,000 years. It's worked for over 100 years in the Pentecostal church. We may not know all the stuff everybody else knows, but we know how to get a hold of God, and we know what God will do when He shows up. God is at work, and we need to let Him work. But I, I think we need to understand on the part of that, He said it twice in this passage of Scripture. He said it is, it is the same God working in all and it's at the end, it is for Paul. God's not doing it for him. God's doing it for you. God's doing it for you. Yes. He knows what you need. He knows what you need. I remember when the Holy Spirit came into my life in power. I won't forget it. Something happened in me. I didn't need a church. I didn't need an altar. God grabbed a hold of my heart and He's never let it. Ms. Francis just shared that last week. Revival. Revival. She didn't tell me, Miss Francis, you didn't tell me who was preaching that week. You didn't tell me one sermon that he spoke. But you told me right about there, right about that hot place that, that, that Gerald gets right there because his feet can't stay on the floor all the time. That hot place right there. That's where she found the Holy Spirit in power. She changed. Hey, his riddle changed. Oh boy, did he change. God's doing it for us. He doesn't need me. I need Him. I need Him. We don't need that anymore. We're, we're the 21st century church. To read the story, just I think it was this week or this past week or the, or the week before. Keep it up with Francis Chan. Francis Chan just won't fit in a box. He's pastoring a mega church. You're thinking, okay, man, retire there because the you have the peak of ecclesiastical life in America. Mega church, California, doing great. That's all you ever need. He says, you know what? I'm sitting up here using my gifts all the time, and none of y'all are. So I think it's time for me to step down and let you just go on about your business. And I'm going to start a house church. And I'm going to just let anybody off the street come in. Well, that wasn't enough. He says, you know what? I don't want to leave this life without sharing the gospel with the world. That's what the Bible says. Go into all the world and share the gospel. What am I doing sitting here in America when there's people overseas and never heard him? So he went. Went to Myanmar, in fact. And God had a surprise. He began to lay hands on people and they began to be healed. He says, my mind was blown. Now see that? And if you look at that, now hold on for it. He'd been serving God for 54 years and he'd never seen anything like that before. My mind is, I, you know, God works how he works. But he got his mind open to what God you see, we're reading the Bible, they let hands on them and they recover. We think, oh, that was Old Testament. Francis Chan learned, no, that's 2020. That's 2020. God's still doing it. God's still working. God is still able because He cares about the people in Myanmar. You may not. I may not. But God does. God cares about their healing. God cares about what we're going through. Not just so they can hear for the span of their life or see or walk, but so that they'll know there's a God in heaven that loves them and is working for them. This is our history as well. It's what's true for us as well. God is working on our behalf. It's for our profit. It's for our usefulness. But I think all, in addition to those things, I think it's for our closeness. Don't you long to be close to God? When you get out of thinking of His Spirit at work, you get colder and you get more normalized to the, to, to the world. When you're in His presence, you don't know what's going to happen next. And you're anticipating. You're waiting. God, what will you speak? God, what do you want to say? That's what God wants. God wants you close. God wants you caring. He has said more than once in His Bible, He says, seek me. Search for me, not because I'm hiding, but because I want you to make up your mind. You can do it the world's way, or you can seek me and find out how I do it. And you can do my work the world's way. You can. People are all over this world. They're doing God's work the world's way. And in some ways it's a success, but I don't see God's hand in it. How God works 
is He wants you close. Seeking Him, longing for Him, loving Him, and letting Him flow through your life. Sometimes we get used to what we're in. I shared this Wednesday night. I'll, I'll share it again before I hit my final point. You've seen those videos where these colorblind people have these wonderful glasses. I'm so glad that technology's come out. People are, are old families I saw get together and buy these glasses for this one person. There's a guy I saw, Harley shirt. Language wasn't nice either. Um, he was, you know, tough, tough, just normal dude. And uh, they gave him these pair of glasses, blackened glasses, and he put them on. That big old man started crying. Tears started running out of it because he never knew those colors were in the world. He only saw in grays and in muted hues. But when he got he got enlightened, so to speak, the, the glasses enabled him to see a world that was always around him. It was right there. He just never saw it. What I'm asking in my spirit is what's around us right now. What gifts have been stored up in the heavens right now. And they have been a portion for February the 16th. How many of those have been laid out for us in every service, every time we're here together. And we walk on as if they're not even there at all. I can just move on because it doesn't matter. I don't really, really need that gift. I disagree. I believe we do. I pointed out the last, last point I wanted to make, and it's that he distributes these. As he works in all of these, he distributes them individually as he wills. Here's where the problem has always been. Bar none, I had it when I, when I, was, I was newer in the faith. I had it. You know, Lord, move. But move in somebody else. Don't move in me. Don't make me do nothing funny, Lord. Don't, don't, don't make me do nothing that's wild. Don't make me do nothing that's crazy. Don't, don't do that, Lord. I didn't trust Him. Let's just get honest. I didn't trust Him. And my pride meant more than His prayers. I think that's why God's had me to do crazy stuff before. Just to say, listen, it should be a pleasure to serve me. It should be an honor to be a fool for Christ because I certainly made myself a fool for you. I died as a common thief, the exact opposite of everything I am, and I did it to save you from an eternal darkness and fire and damnation that you, I didn't want you to suffer with, so I was willing to go to the cross for you. Why is it so hard for you to be a fool for me? Amen. When the foolishness is not what he cares about. He wants us to know things we don't know. He wants to do things in our life that we can't do on our own. Where's the foolishness? Where is it? It's not there. It's just God's got to get us to trust. Him. He will distribute it to us as He wills. You can't loan it out. You say, well, that person's spiritual. God, you speak to them. Do it in them. And I'll clap. I'll clap. I'll praise the Lord to you. You see, I found when the Lord taps on your shoulder, He wants you. He don't want your neighbor. He don't want your companion. He wants you. And I have tried to pray him away. Lord, move on somebody else. But you know what? He's done it. He didn't really necessarily move on to somebody else, but I felt something broke in me. I just said, God, I don't want you. You know what that does to the Spirit of God? He backs up. And I realize I've been breathing your air. I've been living your life. And I just asked to step away. And I thought it was just you fixing to work here. You work always in everything. This peace that I constantly have, it's from you. This joy I constantly have from you. I want to step back from that. I felt it in that moment. And I apologize. And then he tapped me on the shoulder again. I tell you the story about him in the boys' dorm one time. That was that was good, but it was bad at the same time. It was, it was, it was interesting. But God taught me, I want to use you for nobody else. Nobody else. I have been used before and other people wouldn't know about it. I got the blessing they didn't. And they regretted that choice. God does it as He wills. God will not let you depend on somebody else. God will not expect you to just let everybody else do it and you be a part of it. God says in this passage, the Spirit works distributing to each one individually as He wills. 
The Bible says it shouldn't just be the person behind the pulpit who is filled and moved by the Spirit. It should be all. There's no name given in the Corinthian church that was the designated spiritual person. There was no designated little group. Well, there's an amen corner of the Corinthian church. They'll do all the spiritual stuff and, and we'll just go along with them. No. It was the church. Everybody. And that's what was so mind blowing. You can use everybody? Yes. Because I have desired everybody. Nobody left out. I desire you all. Now, Brick, what you going to do something for me? Coming to a close here. We think about what the Spirit wants to do. I just made a mess in church. Y'all saw that. <laughs> Ethan, you'll come help me, sir. Thanks, sir. I told, I told, I told Ethan what I wanted him to do, but I told him it would be easy. Ethan, I'm going to assume either mommy or daddy has asked you to vacuum, so I'm going to ask you to please vacuum, sir. Okay. You know how to click that little button. What's that little button? Okay. Okay, maybe, maybe y'all have this version at home. Now, there you go. Go take it. You have to go a little hard. Come on, work hard. Dig into it, man. Come on. Maybe you go around the other way. Over there. Maybe, maybe you turn it this way. All right, now. It's got simplicity on the back. It's got to be simple. It's got to be. You know what? I don't think it's working. What's the problem? It's not plugged in. Is that important? Why is that important? Oh, it gives it electricity, so it needs power to do all that? Let's not do that. That's too much trouble. Let's just go get a broom. You want to get a broom? No, I'll get a broom. Nah, it's okay. Thank you. I'll get somebody to get a broom. Because this is what we do as a church. I want spirit to move. And this won't work. It's not working. So I'll just go get a room. I'll just do it myself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the Spirit wants. Yeah. I think not with the guy who has. Three main points he makes in this passage. The same God, the same Spirit, over and over and over again. God is at work. And He's working in all these different gifts. Gifts. Gifts to be unwrapped. Gifts to use. There's other gifts as well that Paul didn't even touch on. <laughs> other passages, and Romans particularly, points out some more. But the Holy Spirit says, you can't do this without me. But I am here to help you. I'm here to empower you. Isn't that the first description Jesus said? You will be endued with power from on high. Peter probably knew every word he spoke on the day of Pentecost. There was nothing he learned in the upper room. He didn't learn anything about what they did to Jesus. He didn't learn anything about him ascending to heaven. He watched it with his own eyes before that time. He learned nothing. So tell me, church, what happened in that upper room? I'll tell you what happened. Exactly what Jesus said. You will be endued. You will be filled. You will be, be poured into you power from on high. His sermon took five minutes. Signing up the membership role took over an hour. Because thousands said, I want Jesus. You want to know what power is? It is doing God's work with God's power. And seeing the results. 